The whole problem is that the information avalanche crashing down on our consciousness on a daily basis began its course about 15 years ago. The speed of the information flow is becoming dozens of times faster than our brains have time to adapt. We are simply not evolutionarily prepared for such lightning fast changes. But who's going to ask us? Evolutionary frenzy is belched right into our faces, or rather into our brains, which as it turns out, can be very easily programmed. The technology of five stages of programming our consciousness, including the example of how it's been done in recent events with Russia and Ukraine, will be explained in this episode to enable you to keep your brain clean. So, first of all, we need to choose a theme to drag from the state of unthinkable for our consciousness to the normality of life. You can think of anything, even a fantastic theme, for example, people's negative thoughts provoke emissions in the air, or pants are better worn on the head, or 99% of wages the state has decided to take for itself. I think you began grinding your teeth when you had heard this last phrase, so let's take this one. To work for just 1% of your salary sounds unbelievable, even stupid, but you know, the idea of the universal basic income once seemed insane as well. But somehow they sat down, discussed it, and even tried it in the advanced countries like Switzerland and Finland. Yes, the result was rendered ineffective, but that didn't stop them from starting discussions. If there was an attempt to just hand out money from the state, why not try the opposite approach? But of course we are not going to try it, we have a purely scientific interest. In the blink of an eye, a working group of researchers has already been set up. But some crazy people have also appeared who are already shouting on the internet, GIVE ALL OUR MONEY TO THE STATE! And here we are, right now discussing the subject, and the wackos on the internet are only helping us. After all, the number of expressions on the topic has only increased. On the one hand, scientists with their hypotheses, and on the other, radical communists who will simply be made fun of in the current realities. But the process of making fun of means an increase in the citation of the phenomenon. As they say, there is no colour to PR. Thus, we have made the transition from the unthinkable to the radical. Thus, we have introduced outright madness into our information field. That was the first step. Step number two. In the second step, we need to appeal to curiosity, research and diversity. So, we need to come up with a new, soft term for our phenomenon. It is not like the state is forcibly taking all your money, they are simply centralizing money for better management. Moreover, why are we always talking about money? In time, we will come up with yet another softer term. The accumulation of population's resources. No one is taking money from anyone. The state is only accumulating resources. Creating a soft term is very important in the current step. You have to detach the form of the word from its meaning. The main rule is that the new word has to be made in a way that society does not associate it with the time in the past when it was unacceptable. And then the same scientists, joined by intellectuals, start discussing the accumulation of resources in the population. And then it turns out that once upon a time there was such a thing in Rome, or even in the history of your country. And there's still some work to be done to explore what effect it's had. So, here we moved from the radical to the acceptable. Step number two is complete. Step number three. Now that we are already freely discussing the accumulation of population's resources, we have to determine people's attitudes to this. On the left, we have radical opponents, and on the right, we have radical supporters. The main focus here is to do two things. Firstly, we need to admit that there are radical points of view and they have the right to exist. 
But at the same time, ordinary people who are against the accumulation must be labelled as radicals. We need to try to brand them as uneducated ignorants who do not understand a single thing, and generally they want their own country to be weaker. Just a little longer and we will call them internal enemies, or the ones being controlled by an external enemy. After all, just think about it, accumulation has its disadvantages but it also has its positive sides. So, the new phenomenon falls somewhere in the middle between radical against and radical for, embodying some kind of sanity and progressivity. Congratulations, we have moved on to the realm of sensible. Step number four. The topic has gone viral. It is no longer just discussed in narrow circles, but by the masses at large, thanks to the media, of course. The most important thing is to find popular people who will say that they would be happy to give 99% of their income to the state because it will strengthen people's power, make society equal and justice will prevail in the country. So we will need talk show hosts, artists and bloggers for that. I vote for accumulation. Accumulation isn't about taking away at all. So it's for the greater good. Don't be selfish. Oh, I heard that George Washington did that. That was Franklin's idea. Once upon a time, Jesus. Step number five, the final shot. Since all possible studies have been conducted and public debate now leads to the masses literally asking for the implementation of resource accumulation, those who planned it all from the beginning come out from the shadows and listen sensitively, out of the kindness of their hearts, to the wishes of the common people. Opinion polls are being published, confirming the wishes of the majority. There is a high proportion of supporters for a strong, solid and indestructible state. We are at the end of the play. The authorities are preparing a legislative framework and a new dogma is being introduced into society. The happiness of the individual is forbidden. One can only be happy for the whole country. If you get a slight chill at the possibility of a similar event, it confirms the viability of this technology. And it was invented, no, not by me, the one who created it was Joseph Overton. You have to admit, it all sounds pretty cool. Someone powerful out there is controlling us and by the technology of someone called Joseph Overton. I'm telling you, the best myth is a collection of half-truths slightly mystified by the presence of the world government. Hmm? Let me explain. There is a widely spread essay on the Russian internet called Technology of Destruction, which tells that society's values can be changed by employing five steps. There are six states of attitude to the topic. You remember them from the previous chapter. And if you use the tools, namely topics transition from the taboo into the info field, creating a soft term, labeling the opponents as radicals, condemning radical non-acceptance and acceptance of the topic, popularizing through on-screen heroes and legitimizing, then you can shift the public consciousness, move that Overton window and make anything acceptable as the norm. And by anything, I mean literally anything. Now, look, I'm going to read this widely spread on the Russian Internet article in full. It has been the subject of conspiracy theories for almost 10 years. And if you are asking why it is so, let me tell you what example the author used for the explanation of Overton Window. It's cannibalism. So, sit back, relax and listen to the story. Of course, if you don't want to listen to it, you can read it yourself via the link in the description and skip to this timestamp. The main line of the video will continue from there. All right, here we go. Joseph P. Overton, a senior vice president of the McKinniac Center for Public Policy. He described how ideas that were totally alien to society were lifted from the cesspit of public contempt, cleaned up and eventually legislated. 
According to the Overton window, for every idea or problem in society, there is a so-called window of opportunity. Within this window, the idea may or may not be widely discussed, openly supported, promoted or attempted to be legislated. The window is moved, thus changing the window of opportunity from the unthinkable stage that is completely alien to public morality and completely rejected to the relevant policy stage that is already widely discussed, accepted by the mass consciousness and anchored in the law. Here I will use an example to show how, step by step, society first discusses something unacceptable, then considers it appropriate, and finally resigns itself to a new law that secures and protects the once unthinkable. Let's take something completely unimaginable as an example. Let's take cannibalism, that is the idea of legalizing the right of citizens to eat each other. A tough enough example, isn't it? But it is obvious to all of us that right now, 2014, there is no way to roll out cannibalism propaganda. Society would bristle. This situation means that the problem of legalizing cannibalism is at stage zero of the window of opportunity. This stage, according to Overton's theory, is called the unthinkable. Let us now simulate how this unthinkable will be achieved as a norm by going through all the stages of the window of opportunity. Step 1. How bold? The subject of cannibalism is still disgusting and totally unacceptable in society. It is undesirable to discuss the subject either in the press or, much less, in a decent society. So far, it is unthinkable, absurd, taboo. Accordingly, the first movement of the Overton window is to move the subject of cannibalism from the unthinkable to the radical. Well, we do have freedom of speech, don't we? Well, why not talk about cannibalism? Scientists are supposed to talk about everything. There are no taboo subjects for scientists. They're supposed to study everything. If that's the case, let's have an ethnological symposium on exotic Polynesian rites. We will discuss the history of the subject, introduce it into science, and get an authoritative statement about cannibalism. You see, cannibalism, it turns out, can be discussed substantially and somehow remain within the bounds of scientific respectability. The Overton window has already moved. That is, the revision of positions has already been marked. This ensures the transition from an adamantly negative public attitude to a more positive one. At the same time, as the near-scientific discussion appears, some sort of society of radical cannibals is bound to emerge. Even if it appears only on the internet, the radical cannibals will be noticed and quoted in all the necessary media. Firstly, this is another fact of the statement. And secondly, scumbags of such special genesis are needed to create an image of a radical scarecrow. They will be the bad cannibals, as opposed to another scarecrow, fascists who call for the burning on bonfires of those who are not like them. But about them a little further down below. For a start, it is enough to publish stories about what some British scientists and some radical scumbags of a different nature think about human eating. The result of the first movement of the Overton window. An unacceptable theme is introduced, a taboo is desacralized, the unambiguity of the issue is destroyed. Gradations of grey are created. Step 2. Why not? Next, the window goes a step further and moves the subject of cannibalism from the radical realm to the realm of the acceptable. At this stage, we continue quoting scientists. After all, you can't turn your back on knowledge, can you, about cannibalism? Anyone who refuses to discuss this should be labelled a prude and a hypocrite. While condemning hypocrisy, one must surely come up with an elegant name for cannibalism so that all sorts of fascists don't dare label those who dissent with the C word. Pay attention. The creation of a euphemism is a very important point. In order to legalize an unthinkable idea, its true name must be replaced. There is no more cannibalism. It is now called, for example, anthropophagy, but this term will also be replaced again very soon, recognizing this definition as offensive as well. 
The purpose of inventing new names is to take the essence of the problem away from its naming, to detach the form of the word from its meaning, to deprive its ideological opponents of use of language. Cannibalism turns into anthropophagy and then into anthropophilia just as a criminal changes their name and passport. Parallel to the naming game is the creation of a reference precedent, historical, mythological, topical or simply invented, but most importantly, legitimized. It will be found or invented as proof that anthropophilia can actually be legitimized. Remember the legend of the self-sacrificing mother who gave her blood to the thirsty children? And the stories of the ancient gods who ate everyone altogether? The Romans had it as a matter of routine. Well, the Christians are all right with anthropophilia. They still ritually drink blood and eat the flesh of their god. You're not accusing the Christian church of anything, are you? Who the hell are you people? The main objective of this stage is to at least partially remove the eating of people from the criminal justice system, for once at least at some point in history. Step 3. That's about right. Once legitimizing precedent has been given, it is possible to move the Overton window from the realm of the acceptable into the realm of the sensible. This is the third stage. It completes the fragmentation of a single problem. The desire to eat people is genetic, it's in human nature. Sometimes it is necessary to eat people, there are unavoidable circumstances. There are people who want to be eaten. Anthropophiles are provoked. Forbidden fruit is always sweet. A free man has the right to decide what he eats. Don't withhold information and let everyone know if they're an anthropophile or an anthropophobe. Is there harm in anthropophilia? The inevitability of it has not been proven. A battlefield for the problem is artificially created in the public consciousness. Scarecrows are placed on the opposite flanks, radical supporters and radical opponents of cannibalism who have emerged in a special way. Real opponents, that is, normal people who do not want to remain indifferent to the problem of cannibalism detabooing, are being tried to be packaged together with scaremongers and enlisted as radical hate mongers. The role of these scaremongers is to actively create an image of crazy psychopaths, aggressive, fascist haters of anthropophilia who call for cannibals, Jews, communists and blacks to be burned alive. The media presence provides with all of the above but the real opponents of legislation. At this stage, the so-called anthropophiles themselves remain as if in the middle between the scarecrows in the territory of reason from where, with all the theatrics of common sense and humanity, they condemn fascists of all stripes. Scientists and journalists at this stage prove that humanity has, throughout its history, eaten each other from time to time and that this is normal. The subject of anthropophilia can now be moved from the realm of the sensible to the category of the popular. The Overton window moves on. Step 4. In a good way. To popularize the theme of cannibalism, it is necessary to support it with pop content, juxtaposing it with historical and mythological figures and, if possible, with contemporary media personalities. Anthropophilia is infiltrating the news and talk shows en masse. People are being eaten up in movies of wide distribution, in song lyrics and video clips. One of the tricks of popularization is called Look Around You. Didn't you know that one famous composer is a anthropophile? One famous Polish screenwriter was an anthropophile all his life. He was even persecuted. And how many of them were in asylums? How many millions have been deported, deprived of their citizenship? By the way, what did you think of Lady Gaga's new video, Eat Me Baby? At this stage, the topic is taken to the top and it starts to self-reproduce in the media, showbiz and politics. Another effective technique is to actively discuss the issue at the level of information operators, journalists, TV presenters, public figures, etc., cutting off specialists from the discussion. Then, at a point when everyone is bored and the discussion has reached an impasse, a specially selected professional comes along and says, Gentlemen, that's not really how it works. And it's not that, it's this. And you have to do this and that. 
and in the meantime he gives a very definite direction, the tendency of which is set by the window's movement. In order to justify the supporters of legislation, they use the humanization of criminals by creating a positive image of them through non-criminal characteristics. These are creative people. So he ate his wife. So what? They genuinely love their victims. Eating is loving. Anthropophiles have high IQs and are otherwise morally strict. Anthropophiles are victims themselves. They're forced by nature. They were raised that way, etc. These kinds of tricks are the essence of popular talk shows. We'll tell you a tragic love story. He wanted to eat her, and she only wanted to be eaten. Who are we to judge them? Could it be love? Who are you to stand in the way of love? Step 5. We are the power here. The fifth step of the Overton Window movement is reached when the topic has been warmed up to the possibility of moving it from the popular to the realm of actual policies. The preparation of the legislative framework begins. Lobbying groups in power consolidate and come out of the shadows. Opinion polls are published, supposedly confirming a high percentage of supporters of cannibalism's legislation. Politicians begin to roll the pilot rounds of public statements on the subject of legalizing the topic. A new dogma is introduced into the public consciousness. It is forbidden to forbid eating people. This is the trademark of liberalism. Tolerance as a ban on taboo, a ban on correcting and preventing deviations destructive to society. During the latest phase of the Windows movement from popular to actual policies, society is already broken. The liveliest part of it will still somehow resist the legislative stipulation of not-so-long-ago unthinkable things, but the society as a whole is already broken. It has already accepted its defeat. Laws have been passed. The norms of human existence have been changed, destroyed. Then the topic will inevitably echo down to schools and kindergartens, which means the next generation will grow up with no chance of survival at all. Such a wild example has opened a can of worms, or should I say a can of conspiracy theorists on the internet. Here is a channel with a magnificent head cover, Evolve With Us, doing the same thing retelling an article, or rather a copy-paste from 2014, with the final conclusion that the evil there is the capitalists, the world government. Here they are, those pyramids, eyes and other attributes of the Committee of 300. Oh, really, truth, evolve with us. And the video's been viewed by 2 million people. I wish I could see the dislikes, but 126,000 likes are a shitload for sure. In a society where it seems as if the powerful are in charge, it is, at first glance, peaceful to live in. After all, there are people who make all the important decisions, and you specifically have only to give up your own subjectivity and surrender to the power of the sweet hit or miss. The Overton window was invented by Joseph all of a sudden Overton. He got a bachelor's degree in electrical engineering and then a doctorate in law. He was a senior vice president of the McKinney Center for Public Policy. And apparently an engineering view on society helped him see the concept. Once again, the concept or the model, but not the technology. Its essence is that there is a framework of topics that are acceptable in society at a given time, and stepping outside these boundaries towards bigger or smaller freedoms can make you unpopular. Just a quick and clear example. Imagine what would have happened to a person if they had spoken out in 2017 in favor of entering cafes via the QR code. He would have been put in an insane asylum at best. An important comment here. No, I'm not advocating that the virus is a chemical weapon. No, I don't think anyone wants to kill us on purpose. And yes, vaccines work. And yes, so does the Russian Sputnik V. We even had a video about it. 
Now, who gives a damn about this window anyway? Politicians. American politicians. Who need to know what to talk about so as not to get into trouble and lose popularity. More specifically, lose votes during elections. And they really have a federation there, unlike the Russian Federation. There is political activity. Every state has its own regulations. It would be inconvenient to come to the home state of gun fans and start chanting that guns should be banned. Well, roughly speaking. And that McKinney Center for Public Policy, where Overton work, still exists to this day. There's no mystique here. Joseph Overton originally proposed the concept to justify the work of analytical centres. In other words, it was needed to explain to the potential sponsor of the centre the importance of opinion-forming activities. That is, the centre's employees would come to the sponsors and say, so, in order to get into some local council, you'd better say this, but these topics shouldn't be spoken about. That's all, they helped politicians to be more politically literate in their statements. Moreover, the very name Overton Window was not invented by Overton. It was invented three years after Overton himself died. The visual form of it was introduced by Overton's colleague Nathan Russell, and the concept now had a shell. Then it was introduced by some guy named Joshua Trevino. He sort of refined this picture by adding the stages you are already familiar with – unacceptable, radical and the rest. The window became really popular after Joseph Lehman met the writer and politician Glenn Beck in 2010. This Glenn Beck wrote a fantastic bestseller and put the notorious window in it, but his version acquired a fundamental difference. Now the window is not a guide model on how to look at the current public sentiment and adjust your actions, but a technology to change the consciousness of society with your own hands. This layman who told Beck about the concept is still featured on the website of the Center for Public Policy, where, as an explanatory piece, he says, Common misperception about the Overton window, and that is that politicians themselves move the Overton window. That's backwards. What politicians are good at is detecting where the Overton window is and reacting to it at any point in time. The Overton window cannot tell you if a policy is good or bad. What the Overton window does is tell you what policies are on the verge of possibility. Ideas that are near the edge of the Overton window but just outside of it may be tomorrow's policy reality. And it was in 2010 when interest in the Overton window flared up in America. But here, in Russia, the outburst was organized by a regular blogger in January 2014. He took Trevino's visuals, read Beck's book, added cannibalism to it and pressed the publish button. Who knew that this button would launch a real information bomb? Here's a graph of interest in the window since 2014 in Mother Russia. The interest started right after the January 14, 2014 publication of the article. And radicals of all sorts, from conspiracy theorists to ultra-patriots, have come to believe that there is the technology allowing to program the mind, although the original Overton window is actually a way of looking at public sentiment to determine what people approve of. It is a model. 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 By the way, it turns out that there are even professors who write articles that cannot be called academic, no matter how hard you try. This is straight from the website of a Russian university. The naming there is on the level of scandal rag, and it's named Overton Window, a threat to the development of society. And it tells about influencing people's minds, manipulating the masses. It uses the words zombification directly. Turns out Overton was not helping American politicians get votes. He was studying how immoral value systems could be introduced into society. And what does it all come down to? Correct, the substitution of cultural values and traditions. And who's to blame? That's right, gays. But we have blurred the author's data for a reason. The fact is that our professors are in a very difficult position. Their standards are tied to the type of scientific publications, so I do not know the author. It is quite possible that the article was made for formality, to provide them with something to eat. 
and it's not about the author. It is about the whole phenomenon in our country. It's like accusing a cashier of demanding you to wear a mask. But to be fair, there are videos on the internet, at least in the Russian segment, debunking this conspiracy theory, pointing to the original meaning and how it transformed in the internet. But I hope you won't fall out of your chair now. The thing is, I believe that this twisted Overton window theory can work. Let's take another look at the six states and the five tools of transition to these states. Let's leave the debunking of myths out of the brackets and highlight these five tools. Introduction to the info field, creating a soft term, illusion of sensible debate, popularization through on-screen heroes, legitimization. Personally, it seems to me that these are the usual tools of propaganda or political spin machines, whichever you prefer. Spin is a form of propaganda achieved through knowingly providing a biased interpretation of an event or campaigning to influence public opinion about some organization or public figure. A standard tactic used in spinning is to reframe or modify the perception of an issue or event to reduce any negative impact it might have on public opinion. Take the tool number two, watch how it works. In Russia, some media and the government officials, including Putin, often replace the original word with a softer substitute, so to make it sound less radical and more abstract and distant. So, guess explosions become pops. Economic crisis becomes negative growth. Navalny becomes the Berlin patient. In general, politicians are not the only ones to use such a technique to soften the issue. Not a cam whore, but a webcam model. Not a charity, but a donation. And here we are no longer. Please spare something for the poor mankind people. But. Yo, give me your donos. Show activity in the chat. Woohoo! Next, tool number three. Well, labeling those who disagree is a good thing in general. They are enemies of the state, extremists, foreign agents. The fourth tool, paying off actors, TV presenters and bloggers for the sake of praise or to express one's position as if they were in favor of the issue. Even in the fifth tool where social polls are used. Let me tell you something if you didn't know. In Belarus, the only polls that are allowed are those that are approved by their dictator, Lukashenko, while in Russia, the Levada Center, a prominent competitor to the Governmental Opinion Research Center, has been added to the register of foreign agents. Yes, these points are not always 100% true, well, because this, like any theory, is ideal. You don't always have to use everything at once, like during the recent invasion of Russia in Ukraine, but sometimes there is an almost textbook example. Increase of the retirement age in Russia. The act was signed into law on October 3, 2018, but the information work started three years before that, in early 2015. Remember what the internet's mutated Overton window started from? But you know, the idea of the universal basic income once seemed insane as well. But somehow they sat down, discussed it and even tried it in the advanced countries. Yes, the result was rendered ineffective, but that didn't stop them from starting discussions. Starting discussions. So, in January 2015, the Minister of Economic Development declares that the discussion about increasing the retirement age has a valid point. Well, here we go. Labour and finance ministries say a refusal to increase retirement age will make it harder for people to get pensions on a number of occasions. Former finance minister speaks out in favour. And just a couple of days later, on the annual direct line, Putin said, Now, 
том числе и по пенсионному возрасту. Но, во-первых, это нужно делать в открытом диалоге с обществом. Нужно, чтобы люди понимали, что происходит. Have you noticed? We've already reached the second stage. It is already possible to discuss the topic, but it may seem radical for the time being. The softening of the issue in this case is the but look at them approach. Yes, the softening will also include a law to increase the retirement age for officials. Well, it's not for us, it's for them. Then softening messagings begin to appear, saying that this is actually being done to prolong the productive lives of retirees, and also messages spoken as a citizen and not a government official. In 2017, we are in the third stage, when we are sort of already forced to recognize the importance of the issue. There are different points of view. We need to take a sensible attitude, as Putin's spokesman explicitly says. There is no unified point of view on the pension reform, nor are there any decisions made. In 2018, we were already in the fourth stage, when statements about the necessity of the phenomenon are already emerging. Even popular Russian sellout bloggers and influencers joined the informational whirlwind speaking out, of course, in favor of the issue. So, on October the 3rd, 2018, the act has officially been signed. Stage 5 is over. The mutated Overton window was being moved for about three years from unacceptable to legislative stage. If the example with the increase of retirement age seemed alien to you, Let's take a look at another example, the one you most certainly know of, the war between Russian authorities and Ukraine. Like we said before, you don't always have to use every tool of the Overton window all at once. That's exactly the case here. All of you know there is a conflict on Ukrainian soil. The most sensible part of people call it war. But war sounds radical and harsh, doesn't it? Why don't we de-escalate the term to pacify true Russian patriots and possibly the rest of the world? Special military operation. Sounds good enough? At least it does so for Putin, who initiated calling the invasion a special military operation. Well, if that doesn't seem soft enough, they've also got a name with a noble message in it. Liberation operation. People in Duma and the senator from Crimea, for example, do not mind claiming that what's happening in Ukraine, Donbass and Lugansk is a liberation operation in order to set people free from the fascist regime. This is how authorities tried to soften the term war. Perhaps that might have worked for some, but generally it's been to no avail. Funnily enough, here I'm getting a bit ahead of myself, authorities have banned certain words in media, so you can no longer call the conflict a war an assault and an invasion. Call the thing correctly, special military operation, or else get blocked, period. But does this Overton window really affect the mind? Do people really believe in it? No, of course not. For a mutated window to work, it vitally needs two pillars. One, irremovability of power. Two, forceful resolution of disagreements. And voila! If the governing system knows that it will stay for another 20 years, then it can plan for 10 to 20 years of change. And if you add the willingness to deal with disagreements by force, then there is no conspiracy theory, much less mysticism. People just don't want to get their heads clubbed with a rubber button. However, the creators of the Overton concept do admit that sometimes politicians do move it at their own will. Sometimes politicians can move the Overton window themselves by courageously endorsing a policy lying outside the window. But this is rare. Well, that happens so over there in the US. But it's not that uncommon in a place where a vertical power structure has been developing for about 20 years. It's more of a rule here. In Russia, we often remember our delightful situation eight years ago, when approvals for protest were not required, when you could not get jail time for posting so-called unwanted pictures, when the feelings of the religious could not be offended, when the media and even individuals could not be declared as foreign agents. All this was unthinkable then, but now it is a legal norm. 
Here, of course, the sophisticated viewer may argue that we have fallen into learned helplessness in this block, or that it is essentially five stages of accepting the inevitable. But I don't think that's a bad thing. I would even say that the mutated on the internet version of the Overton window is a refined instruction of learned helplessness at the state level, possible only in the presence of irremovability of power and forceful resolution of disagreements. And knowing this, while well, looking at today's news, looking at today's events, you can guess future possible scenarios for the next three or five years. What seems unthinkable today could become the legislation tomorrow. <laughs>